Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to begin our webinar. I'm Steve Love, President and CEO of the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council. And we want to thank all of you for taking time this afternoon to participate in this educational webinar. And it's hosted in coordination with Hall Renda. And I think most of you know Hall Renda. Uh, they're an associate member of the council. And in addition to that, they sponsor many of our events. Today's topic is employment practices in 2021, preparing for change. This is certainly a relevant discussion since we've had recent elections. With the new administration planning to make changes in employment and labor laws, those decisions are gonna impact an employer's daily operations. During this webinar, we're going to look at some of the anticipated changes in the wage and hour law, leave management, and labor relations. We have an excellent speaker today. In fact, she's spoken to us before uh, a couple of years ago. It's Robin Sheridan, an attorney and shareholder at Hall Renda. She counsels many of her healthcare clients in many and numerous aspects of the health law. She has also served as a general counsel to a very growing community hospital. And in that role, she advised on daily issues, as many of you know, corporate governance, contract preparation, physician transactions, patient care issues, accreditation, EMTALA, and compliance. Robin uh, truly, as I mentioned, has spoken at previous events. Her expertise is very impressive, and we're really looking forward to hearing from Robin today on these very pertinent and current issues. So it's my pleasure to turn this over to Robin Sheridan. Thanks, Steve. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. In the next hour, we're going to talk about a number of employment issues created by the pandemic, as well as some new and anticipated changes in employment law, given, as Steve said, we have a new administration in Washington, DC. As, as you may have guessed, this presentation won't be all inclusive because things are changing in Washington on a daily basis, sometimes more often than daily. But we've identified for your presentation today what we think are the major changes impacting healthcare employers in their daily operation in, in the most immediate future. So unfortunately, COVID continues. And so one thing we did want to talk about today is uh, what I call the aftermath of COVID and um, still changing legislation addressing COVID in the workplace. Um, the four uh, subjects that we're going to talk about um, with respect to COVID are greater expectations for workplace safety, changes to the Families First Coronavirus Response Act that just um, hit us last week, telework, and the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the ever popular topic of vaccinations. Changes to um, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, or what you'll hear me referred to as FFCRA, um, occurred as recently as uh, one week ago today when the Coronavirus Relief Act was signed by the president. It's also called the American Rescue Plan Act. So you may hear it referred in the media is, is either the Relief Act or the Rescue Plan Act. Um, as I said, that's signed by the president one week ago today um, and has, has uh, contained some changes to FFCRA that are important that you know. Um, we uh, decided to address telework in the ADA because work from home really changed the way a lot of us do business and not always in a good way. Um, so what do we do with telework or remote working now? 
and vaccinations. I heard them called Fauci ouchies yesterday. I thought that was that was kind of cute. Um, but vaccinations have created so many issues and, and will continue to create so many issues for employers. So starting with workplace safety. Um, as I'm sure you heard, OSHA was very publicly criticized for not taking an aggressive role during COVID and for not promulgating standards specific to COVID. So not surprisingly, immediately following inauguration, uh, President Biden issued an executive order to the, a number of federal agencies, but primarily OSHA, to take swift action to reduce the risk that, that workers could contract COVID-19 in the workplace. Then last week, as part of that American Rescue Plan that I just mentioned, $200 million was allocated for worker protection activities, 100 million of which was earmarked to OSHA with specific instructions that not less than 5 million of those dollars be used for enforcement activities related to COVID-19 and done at the high risk workplaces, including healthcare. Healthcare was specifically called out in the Relief Act as a high risk workplace um, to which OSHA was directed um, to focus its attention. So while it's wonderful to see that Congress recognizes the risks that our workers are facing every day, it also means that you're going to be under much more scrutiny from OSHA than you have been historically. And what's OSHA going to do? Well, um, as we've started to see already, we expected OSHA to issue some standards, a temporary standards probably, but instead, um, I think actually yesterday, they released the compliance directive, which established a national emphasis program for COVID-19, as well as an enforcement plan. So essentially, the intent of a directive is to focus on the high risk industries and target those industries where there's a risk of close contact exposures. So OSHA has through this latest initiative said that at least 5% of its region inspection goal is going to be targeted for these high workplace inspections. These inspections are not going to replace inspections triggered by complaints or referrals. So they're not gonna count inspections that result um, from complaints or referrals as part of this 5%. It's gonna be an additional 5%. And since healthcare is the number one targeted industry, you can expect unannounced OSHA inspections. So if you don't already have someone internally tagged to oversee those inspections, so someone who has knowledge of how to greet the co-shows, those are the um, compliance officers that come from OSHA to do the inspections. And what you can and cannot um, uh, communicate with them, who they can communicate with, what they can see and what they can be prohibited from seeing, those kinds of how to manage an OSHA inspection issues, you'll wanna get that in place sooner than later because we expect these OSHA inspections to start fairly soon. We've also gotten uh, a number of calls about OSHA reporting um, and record keeping. So as you all know, OSHA requires that employers record certain work-related injuries and illness on that OSHA 300 log. Well, COVID-19 can be a recordable illness if a worker's infected as a result of work-related duties. How do you determine if it's work related? Well, that's the $24,000 question. Um, OSHA issued some guidance in May of 2020, and I included that link um, on the slide here, so it'll be in the materials that are available to you as well. Essentially, that guidance gives us direction on how to determine work relatedness. It's an investigation. First, you ask the employee how he or she believes um, they contracted the illness. While respecting employee privacy, you talk with them about out of work and work-related activities that may have been the source of the illness. 
and you review the work environment. So you do kind of a risk assessment um, for potential exposure in their particular work environment. Um, part of all this is a consideration of other instances of workers. So have, you know, have um, colleagues working side by side been infected um, either at the workplace or outside the workplace. You'll want to document your, this investigation and this analysis because as we've seen OSHA address record keeping violations over the course of the last few months, their evaluation has been based in great part on the reasonableness of the investigation. Did you, you know, make assumptions and write it off, or did you actually conduct an investigation consistent with the guidance? Um, and yeah, as to this investigation, like everything in healthcare, if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. So be sure to uh, refer to the guidance, but also to document your evaluation. Um, a quick note regarding workers' compensation in COVID. In Texas, there's no presumption of work-relatedness for hospital workers. So as with any other illness claim, the, your carrier is going to evaluate compensability, starting with a diagnosis and then an investigation to determine you know, the source of the uh, illness and whether it's work-related. And like any other illness, the investigation is going to hinge on work-related exposures or not. Um, but I wanted to raise local ordinances for your attention. Admittedly, I have not reviewed all the cities and counties of folks online today, or, or um, if I have, it has not been recent. But I wanted to make sure you knew that we have seen local ordinances, local orders, related to COVID-19 in the workplace, sometimes with workers' comp presumption for city or county employees, but also sometimes extending further. Um, like we've seen some cities that have required that you conduct a COVID risk assessment on some regular basis. We've seen others that require workplace safety policies directly um, relevant to, or to COVID exposure issues. Sometimes we'll see a requirement that there be a COVID director named and responsible for the workplace safety with COVID. So if you haven't, check your county, check your city, make sure there's no local ordinances, ordinances that apply to workplace safety related to COVID in your jurisdiction today. So moving on to the FFCRA, as you'll recall, that's the Family's First Coronavirus Response Act. If you think back to March 2020, it seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? And yet it was, it was just a year. But Congress passed the Family's First Coronavirus Response Act, which required, among other things, it was thousands and thousands of pages long, Two parts of it that were um, particularly relevant to employers was the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, or EPSLA, and the Emergency Family Medical Leave Expansion Act, what we call EFMLEA. And both of those acts, both of those provisions required that certain employers provide paid sick leave for absences that were related to COVID-19 tax credits were provided to help us pay for those costs. And as you'll recall, things sort of changed over the course of time. So when it first started or when it was first released, all healthcare employers um, could be exempted from the act. So as a hospital, we could make the decision that everyone in our employee um, was exempted from the act because we needed all hands on deck to address COVID. And then the rules changed and only certain healthcare employees were permitted to be exempted. And then the mandate expired on December 31st, 2020. So tax credits, um, the tax credits that were provided to help employers pay for those costs were extended to April in order to essentially incentivize employers to voluntarily continue providing that paid leave. Now, I want to be really clear, it did not mean you had to continue providing leave. 
under either EPSLA or the expanded Family Medical Leave Act. It simply allowed you to do so and provided you the tax credits for doing so if you decided to voluntarily continue to offer that benefit as of January 1st, 2021 and going forward. Originally scheduled to expire in April, in the COVID relief bill, the uh, Rescue Act that was passed last week, they extended the tax credits again. So now you have until September 30th of 21 to take tax credits for EPSLA or Expanded Family Medical Leave Act. If you want to provide it, it's still not mandatory, but for those who have voluntarily decided to offer, continue to offer it, you can continue to get tax credits through September 30th. Um, other, there were other changes though to FFCRA as part of that relief bill. So um, in addition to the extension of the tax credits, they expanded the reasons in which you, uh, employees were eligible for these leaves. So think back for a moment to the original FFCRA. Employees were eligible for paid leave if they were subject to a quarantine or isolation order, if they were caring for someone that was subject to a quarantine or isolation order, if they had been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine or they were caring for someone in that situation if they were experiencing symptoms and seeking medical diagnosis, or if they were caring for a son or daughter whose school um, or place of care had been closed. So there were those five sort of base reasons, right, for paid leave under FFCRA. Now, uh, given the COVID relief bill, there are more reasons. So you can also uh, base paid leave on receipt of the COVID-19 vaccine, um, for recovery from an injury, disability, illness, or condition related to the vaccine. So if the vaccine makes you sick and you miss a day, that's now under FFCRA. If you're seeking or rating results of a COVID-19 test or a medical diagnosis, and there's been an exposure, you also um, can take leave um, under FFCRA if your employer is still offering it on that voluntary basis. The um, Relief Act has also raised the maximum amount available under expanded family leave from $10,000 to $12,000. And they've added some prohibitions, meaning the tax credit, they're gonna deny the tax credit, I should say, to employers who discriminate in favor of highly compensated full-time employees or employees based on employment tenure. So if you're not uh, if you're only allowing leave selectively, full-time employees, or only to highly compensated employees, or only to employees who have more than X amount of years of service, you're not gonna be eligible for the tax credit anymore. So I wanna just make sure we're all on the same page regarding these changes to FFCRA. The Relief Act did not make paid sick leave mandatory. It just incentivizes with tax credits those who want to voluntarily continue to offer this paid leave. So if you stopped allowing FFCRA leave on January 1st, you don't have to do anything differently as a result of the relief bill. But if you continue to allow leave after January 1st, then I think you wanna consider if you wanna to continue to allow it, does it still make sense for your workplace sort of given how long it's gone on, um, what's your census currently, what's your staffing currently, and what are these new reasons? You, you know, these new reasons for leave and these higher maximums, that, that it now has a different impact on your workplace. So does it continue to make sense for you to voluntarily provide the benefit? If it does, great. Um, you'll want to amend your policies and statements so that they include all these new definitions. If it doesn't make sense anymore, you're gonna to wanna to provide some reasonable notice that you're terminating the benefit. Um, and um, we would be happy, or your regular counsel would be happy to help you manage through how you give that notice and how you reconcile 
sort of the leave to date with it with a discontinuation of those leaves going forward. I want to change gears just a little bit and call your attention to the final entry on this slide, and that's the added COBRA coverage. So FFCRA only applied to employers under 500 employees, and um, the tax credits only applied to private employers, so it didn't apply to public entities. But it appears this, this new COBRA provision in the relief bill applies to everyone everywhere. We're still looking into it. So I'm gonna do a little disclaimer here and ask you to keep an eye on the Hall Render website because we'll post a blog on this as soon as we get some clarification. But at the time of the release of the bill, there, was, there wasn't much, clear, much of any clarification information available. The relief bill appears to require that all employers waive all COBRA coverage for employees who lose them, uh, whose hours are reduced or who lose their employment through September 30th so that they that continuation coverage is guaranteed during this period. There are tax credits associated with this expense. Um, so um, an attempt by the government to help you pay for it. Uh, and the requirement does not apply to individuals who voluntarily resign their employment. But otherwise, it appears that there's going to be a pretty significant notice exercise required for you to give notice to employees who, for example, terminated employment a year ago, but are still in their 18 month COBRA period. Um, and so uh, reaching out to those folks to see if they want to take advantage of this new COBRA benefit. And between you and me, I don't know who's going to say no. Um, there are some limitations for those who have coverage under other plans, so you can prevent double dipping, so to speak, and those who have gone on to Medicare coverage. But otherwise, I think administratively, it's gonna be a pretty heavy lift. Um, if you have a COBRA administrator uh, and you haven't heard from them on this co new coverage benefit, reach out to them right away. They should handle it for you. They should have the notices, um, communicate the notices, talk you through the administration, and, and probably conduct the administration for the most part. If you don't have a COBRA administrator, uh, contact your benefits broker, and certainly we at Hall Render would be happy to help, but getting your arms around who has to have these this new notice and um, for what period it applies, and, and there's some sort of a management of it going forward that's going to be necessary. Um, so you'll want to get your arms around that uh, sooner than later. And as I said, we're going to, as we uh, nuance the details um, on this, we're going to post a blog to the Hall Render website. So you can keep an eye out for that too. So, as we talked about a little earlier, um, work from home was was a um, it became be, te telework and work from home and remote working became um, commonplace uh, during COVID in a way that it never was before. And in, in fact, even an employee's ability to telework was a key consideration to their FFCRA eligibility. If you could telework, you weren't eligible for that paid leave. But um, so many folks got comfortable working from home, many of which I know felt that they were much more productive in, in that setting. And so the, the success of work from home may have created an expectation for some of our employees. And we've gotten a lot of questions from employers with respect to the, the question of, do we have to allow it? You know, because it was in place during COVID and people are you know set up now and working there, does it, are we in the position of having to allow this to continue forever? Or can we force people back to the workplace? So the answer is pretty much a clear, no, you don't have to allow it. And yes, you can return, expect return to the workplace. So for employees who are not disabled, a clear return to the workplace when and how you see fit as the employer. 
for employees that are disabled, it's not an autumn, I, I would say it's not an automatic yes, um, but it's a reversion to what is your common accommodation exercise. So um, the EEOC, and I, I put the link to the guidance on the slide, the EEOC has said that a request to continue to work from home from a disabled employee really should be evaluated as any other request for accommodation always has been evaluated under the ADA. So your interactive discussion, your medical diagnosis, your, you know, your evaluation of alternative reasonable accommodations, just like you'd handle any other request for accommodation. The, um, in this EEOC guidance that I posted there, the specific question asked was, Assume that an employer grants telework to employees for the purposes of slowing or stopping the spread of COVID. When the employer reopens the workplace and recalls employees, does the employer automatically have to grant telework as a reasonable accommodation to any employee with a disability who requests? And the EEOC said no. An employee who requests an accommodation is entitled to an evaluation by the employer, if there's no disability related limitation that requires teleworking, then you don't have to provide telework as an accommodation. So you're gonna go through your same accommodation analysis for disabled employees requesting to continue telework as you did uh, before COVID. Um, the difference may be that the accommodation exercise is of course a fact specific evaluation. So the success of an employee during COVID in a work from home setting. So think of things like the common use of Zoom meetings. Now everybody has, you know, Zoom and Teams and all that um, readily accessible and readily utilized, right? The implementation of share files to share data, um, you know, the whole setup at work from home and the availability of um, connectivity with the workplace. Those those changes, the, the practice changes and the technology changes that so many of us put in place during COVID to enable work from home will no doubt impact the evaluation of a request or the evaluation of the reasonableness, I should say, of the request. So in other words, a request for work from home that was made pre-COVID before we had all these tools, before we you know, met by video, all, all those changes that have taken place. A request for a work from home pre-COVID that was determined to be unreasonable may indeed be reasonable now because of the experience during COVID. So it's not a slam dunk, it's not a guarantee, just because you did it during COVID doesn't mean you get to continue to do it, but it, but it is a consideration and you don't wanna make the mistake of not going through the formal exercise, the interactive discussion, the information from the provider, the evaluation of alternative um, reasonable accommodations. So um, no jumping to conclusions, um, but um, not a guarantee um, just because of COVID either. There are also some wage and hour issues that grew out of work from home that we wanted to mention. So for, for some time, we as employers have struggled with off the clock work, right? How do we prohibit employees from reading email or doing work at home off the clock and recording that time if they engage in that kind of work so that we can pay for it as we're required to do under the Fair Labor Standards Act? That challenge was magnified about a thousand times during work from home. We were still required to maintain accurate records of hours for all our non-exempt employees, just like we were when we were using time clocks or computer check-ins, um, and still required to pay no less than minimum wage and overtime as appropriate. So we encourage you to audit your practices during work from home. Make sure you have records of hours. Make sure you don't have unreported work time that you haven't paid. Make sure you have records of the payment consistent with the uh, wage and hour rules. But as you do so, notice, um, or we wanted to be sure you had note of some Department of Labor flexibility that we were given for work from home. 
that's the uh, links that you see on your screen, uh, guidance from the DOL. So you're, you're all probably familiar with the DOL's rules about continuous workday. That's the rule that says all the time between the performance of the first and the last principal activities of a workday or generally compensable work time. So that's the, you know, you start at one place and you travel to another, all that time is gonna be compensable under the standard continuous workday rules. But the department recognized that applying that guidance to telework was going to discourage flexibility and discourage employers from allowing or making work from home available. And so the department issued this guidance that allows employees telework flexible hours um, and, and the um, exemption from the continuous workday rule so long as it's recorded. So what do I mean by that? So for example, say you and your employee agree to a telework schedule that they're gonna work from seven to nine, from 11.30 to three, and from seven to nine on just weekdays, Monday through Friday. Because your employee's got kids at home and they're trying to uh, monitor or, or teach, you know, the school at home activities um, while they work. And so you agree to this, this um, intermittent schedule, so to speak, to allow your, your employee to fulfill both their parental duties and their duties as an employee. For this kind of schedule, you only have to pay for the hours that they worked. So from seven to nine and 11.30 to three and from seven to 9 p.m. You don't have to pay for all the 14 hours from 7 a.m. when they first started their principal duties to 9 p.m. when they concluded their principal activities because the flexibility permitted the DOL for COVID allows you to make that exemption. Remember, it's a temporary exception and you still have the record keeping requirements. So you need to have that record to, to um, support uh, your failure to apply the continuous workday rules. DOL also recognized that it was an all hands on deck kind of situation during much of the last year. And so part of the guidance in that link you see on your screen was to make clear that an exempt employee could also perform non-exempt duties during COVID and continue to be treated as exempt. So if you have a supervisor that's also providing, uh, also engaged in non-exempt work, line duties, um, because you're short staffed, because the unit's crazy, because of whatever reason, during the public health emergency, that doesn't threaten their, their exemption. Uh, remember that's temporary too, okay? And it only applies so long as you kept that employee on, uh, paid on a salary basis and at the salary basis minimum, which I think is 680 something dollars right now a week. Um, but that were at least two um, exemptions, I would say from the Department of Labor that allowed us to apply the FLSA rules a little more flexibility during work from home that, that we could take advantage of. And so long as there's a public, continues to be a public health emergency, which right now I think extends until April, um, and who knows if it'll be extended then, um, gives us some additional flexibility in that regard. Um, just some additional thoughts on work from home and wage an hour for you. You can't require employees who are covered by the FLSA to pay or reimburse you for items that are business expenses. If doing so is gonna reduce, reduce their earnings below minimum wage. So think about computers and office supplies and internet service. If you have a reimbursement expectation for those charges at all, yeah, because the, it's the employee's sort of personal, um, personal equipment, um, and, and personal like home use internet, you have to make sure that doesn't take them below minimum wage. And you can't require employees to pay or reimburse any of those expenses if the telework is a reasonable accommodation. So if this is a disabled employee that is working from home as their reasonable accommodation, then your payment of that equipment and supplies is part of your accommodation. And now moving on to the ever popular question of the day, vaccinations. 
and to mandate or not mandate vaccinations. Um, unless there is some local ordinance of which we are not aware, there is no law that prohibits you from, max, from mandating the COVID vaccine for your employees. Think of the seasonal flu. You can mandate the seasonal flu. And in fact, uh, CMS and the Joint Commission require that you document your flu vaccine programs and record and report your vaccination rates. The issue with mandating the COVID vaccine, just like it is with the seasonal flu, is the accommodation requirements. So the ADA requires that you provide reasonable accommodation to those that request exemption from the vaccine based on a disability. And Title VII requires that you provide accommodation to those that request exemption based on a sincerely held religious belief. Those same accommodation requirements apply to the COVID vaccine like they do every year to your seasonal flu vaccine. So if you decide to mandate, um, think about the changes that are needed to your seasonal flu vaccine exemption forms, your policy, your evaluation process, that kind of thing. It might need to be revised to apply to COVID. Um, you'll have more requests for exemptions. So you'll want to make sure you have a really good process, a really good review committee. You know, um, it's multifaceted and 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 you know, free of conflicts of interest, so that you can you know really legitimize your review. Um, you want to make sure it's all super documented. Um, and we do have one good case. It actually comes out of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the Federal Court of Appeals applicable to Texas. And this wasn't a COVID case. It was a flu vaccine case, a seasonal flu vaccine case, but it was um, heard in January of this year. So right in you know the height of COVID. And in that case, the court found that um, the, the, employer, the employee wanted a religious exemption from the flu vaccine. And the employer said, is the alternative reasonable accommodation, right? We'll exempt you, but we're going to change your position. That's your accommodation, because we can't let you continue to work in your capacity. Um, but we'll, we'll transfer you positions. And he sued for discrimination under Title VII. And the court said, no. That was a reasonable accommodation, despite the fact that the position was, was, at least in the employee's perception, less desirable duties, less desirable hours actually resulted in a loss of income. The court nonetheless said an alternative position is an alternative reasonable accommodation for, for vaccine exemptions. So something important to keep in mind, um, these decisions are always very fact specific, but it does seem to imply that even in these days of COVID, courts are will be looking at reasonable alternative accommodations for those seeking exemptions and won't expect you to simply turn your head um, for those um, that refuse, even in the midst of, you know, very large, I, I, we're seeing, I know at a lot of employers, very large groups of employees object. So given that hesitation of many employees objecting, a lot of employers are, have asked us about incentives. So we do encourage you to speak with counsel before you implement an incentive program because there's there's a number of sort of gray issues, legal issues that surround the, pro, the um, provision of incentives. So it's a benefit of employment. Therefore, it has to be applied in a non-discriminatory matter, which kind of brings us back to the disabled employee who can't get the vaccine. Not only do they have to be accommodated from the exemption perspective, but also probably from the incentive perspective. And if you don't have a mandatory program, if you just have a voluntary vaccination program and you provide incentives that are sizable, we've seen um, challenges in which the claim is made that this, this incentive was so sizable and so significant that it really wasn't a voluntary program. It was really a mandatory program. And so, uh, sort of uh, elements of a mandatory program needed to be present, and if they weren't, that that was that was problematic. And and then finally, with respect to incentives, legal authority is pretty unclear as to whether a vaccination incentive program is a wellness program. And as many of you know, there are HIPAA and EEOC rules about 
limitations on value and alternative requirements and a lot of procedure around wellness programs. But we don't we don't know at this point, and, and I think it's somewhat a fact specific uh, analysis on how a incentive program is structured and whether it would rise to the level of a uh, wellness program and need to meet that criteria. So moving on to some non-COVID things for a bit, you've all undoubtedly heard of Bostock versus Clayton County. That was the United States Supreme Court decision where they held that the Title VII protection on the basis of sex applies to discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity and gender expression as well. A Texas court has recently held that the state prohibitions on sex discrimination also apply to sex orientation and gender identity expression. So if you haven't updated your policies and your postings, you're gonna to wanna to do that right away. A number of bills that did not pass previous administrations have been reintroduced to expand equal employment opportunities. The Equality Act, which um, has already passed the House and is currently under consideration in the US Senate, would expand federal civil rights law to prohibit sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination in public accommodations. So how does that affect me as a hospital? Well, in your treatment and admission of patients, but also in medical staff privileges. Credentials have been held to be uh, public accommodations. And so they have to be given uh, and awarded uh, without regard to, in this case, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. Also reintroduce this Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. The current bill would require public or private sector employers with 15 or more workers to make reasonable accommodations for pregnant employees. So those of you who have been in re human resources for so long know that for a while, the temporary nature of pregnancy really took pregnant workers out of a lot of the, the ADA kinds of accommodation requirements. Well, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act would ensure that workers and uh, applicants as well with limitations related to pregnancy or pregnancy related conditions um, would be accommodated. So examples described in the bill as accommodation include extra breaks, stools for sitting, limiting contact with certain chemicals, reductions in lifting requirements. Um, and as it currently stands, it would protect workers from retaliation um, for making such requests, but also require leave, uh, paid or unpaid, if a reasonable accommodation is not available. It's currently under consideration in the House, um, but our folks in, in our Washington DC office tell us this is likely to be passed by summer. So keep your eyes open. That will undoubtedly call for um, some policy changes as well. And be heard, um, bringing an end to harassment by enhancing accountability and rejecting discrimination. Um, we haven't seen this bill formally reintroduced to Congress yet, but the Biden administration has referenced this passage several times. So <clears throat> until now, the prohibition against employment discrimination under Title VII only applies to businesses with more than 15 employees. The Be Heard would expand it so, or, or would apply so that all uh, employers of any size were subject to the non-discrimination requirements of the act. It would also include small workplaces and um, categories of workers who, who aren't employees, like independent contractors and your hospital volunteers and interns and fellows and trainees. So a real expansion of non-discrimination um, and uh, it prohibits blanket non-disclosures um, at hire. Um, so not limiting, um, um, some discussions to make it easier for employees to hold supervisors liable for sexual harassment. So a big part of the Be Heard bill is not only the expansion of non-discrimination rules, but um, a, um, a, a furtherance and a cl uh, clamping down um, so that harassment discrimination cases can be more easily brought. New wage and hour issues. You've all heard about the $15 minimum wage. 
Um, our folks in Washington tell us it'll be some likely be something less than $15 an hour, but they certainly expect changes, perhaps graduated um, over some period of time. <clears throat> President-elect Biden has also supported what's called the ABC test for independent contractors. It's going to make it difficult for employers to utilize independent contractors. So those of you who have a big independent contractor base and your providers, for example, are going to want to keep an eye on this. Um, penalties for misclassification are going to jump pretty significantly if um, the administration's goals are reached. It's going to include compensatory damages and they're going to enact fines. So the cost of misclassification is going to increase pretty considerably. If you haven't done an independent contractor audit recently to verify that your independent contractors are truly independent contractors and not employees, we'd encourage you to, to do that soon so that you, you don't get stuck at enactment of um, some of this legislation. And the Page Fairness Act, um, it's already passed the House. It's gonna make it harder for employers to justify paying women less than men. Essentially, um, it, it prohibits employers from using salary history to set wages and make hiring decisions. So you, you aren't going forward, you would not be permitted to use the individual's previous wage as the basis for the new wage. Um, and we, we expect to see some changes as well that would allow these um, Fairness Act cases to proceed pretty easily through the um, agencies through the court system. Uh, just a quick note, keep your eye on local ordinances. A number of cities in Texas have attempted to um, pass paid sick leave in their jurisdiction. They haven't, um, none has survived yet, um, but we expect that they're going to continue to be raised and, and, and may continue to be appealed. And finally, the expansion of the National Labor Relations Act. So I wanted to just remind everybody that the National Labor Relations Act governs most private sector labor relations. It's administered by the National Labor Relations Board that consists of appointees, um, essentially appointees of the president. Um, many of the provisions of the National Labor Relations Act apply to non-union as well as union workers. So think about concerted activity. You get more than one um, uh, employee joining together for a common cause related to terms and conditions of employment, then you have concerted activities. So provisions of the act apply whether you have a unionized workforce or not. The cases decided by the board tell us how the act should be applied in the workplace. Unfortunately, these decisions are almost always politically charged. So the rules change as the administration changes. <clears throat> Under the Trump administration, the board took a decidedly pro-business position on many, many issues. As President Biden continues to roll out his agenda, the administration has made clear they intend to reverse many of these policies. And President Biden's appointees to the board have, have uh, shored that up. In a recent statement on Twitter, I am told that Biden stated, every worker should have a free and fair choice to join a union. Biden's board will likely overturn quite a number of Trump era decisions and make it easier for unions to organize. And so I want to highlight just a few that don't necessarily go to organizing uh, directly, but that certainly apply to non-union workforces as well as union workforces. The return to purple communications. So purple communications was the pre-Trump decision that allowed employees to use employer email systems for union organizing. The Trump board overturned this and said employees can't use an employer's um, internet service, their email system, their distribution list for, employee, for union organizing. But um, we have seen indications that there's gonna be a return to purple communications, which means they will once again be allowed to use your email and your distribution list for union organizing and union purposes. The pre-Boeing standard, um, before the Boeing decision, facially neutral workplace rules, policies, employee handbook provisions, think about your, con you know, your general confidentiality policies that are in every handbook. 
They were, we went through the period where they were found unlawful because they unlawfully interfered with the exercise of, or they were, they were said to unlawfully interfere with the exercise of rights protected by the act. So think about that controversy of the, the standard confidentiality policy was interpreted to limit the exercise of rights because it on its face could be interpreted to say, you can't talk to each other about terms and conditions of employment. So in Boeing, the board concluded that the employer lawfully maintained a no camera rule that prohibited employees from using camera enabled devices without a business need and, and essentially said, you know, the rule potentially affects the exercise of NLA rights because if you can't use camera, you can't take pictures of unlawful activities conducted by your employer. But the impact of that was slight and outweighed by important justifications and legitimate justifications of the employer like security concerns. But again, we've seen an indication that there's gonna be a return to the pre-Boeing standard, which would mean all those policies and your handbooks are gonna to have to be revised. Wanted to mention, we're running out of time and I'm really sorry. I wanted to mention wine garden rights really quickly. So as you probably know, wine garden rights enable union workers to insist on having a representative present when you're doing an investigatory interview that could result in discipline. The previous board um, had decided that these rights don't extend to non-union workers. If we go back, to, uh, if, if we go back to pre-Trump era boards, we expect that the Biden administration's board is going to allow non-union workers to demand the representatives be present again. And finally, the Banner Australia decision. This was the workplace investigation decision. So if you recall, like almost every employer we know has a policy that says, when we're conducting workplace investigations, we're gonna, we're gonna make a statement about confidentiality. We're gonna tell the witnesses we're talking to not to talk about this, outside of our interview, because we don't want the integrity of the investigation to be compromised. Well, a return to Banner Australia, which means you can't prohibit the employees from talking to each other. And so we're gonna have to think about how we conduct workplace investigations and policy and, and procedure revisions to address that should, should the decision come back. So, sorry I went long. Steve, do we have time for a few questions? I think we do, Robin, and thank you for a great presentation. I do have some questions that have come in. I think during your presentation, you made it clear we cannot mandate the COVID-19 vaccine. Is that correct? Um, not, not exactly. You can mandate it. No law prohibits you from mandating it, but you still have to provide accommodation for disability and for religion. So you can't terminate someone whose doctor has said, I don't want them to have the vaccine or who, or who has said, I believe my religion prohibits me from getting the vaccine. We have to go through the accommodation exercise in both those kinds of situations. And we can come up with an alternative accommodation, like we can transfer them into a different position if we feel they, uh, without the vaccine, they provide too much of a hazard to our patients or we can require that Good. they wear respirators all the time and eat lunch separately maybe because removing them during lunch would be risky and not um, and, and um, not consistent with our infection control rules. But we can't simply out of hand terminate employees who refuse to have it. A little different wrinkle. The second question is, if we don't mandate it, can we then require new hires to have to have it? Same rule. Employ uh, applicants are subject to the same accommodation as um, as employees are. So applicants would get the, the uh, disability or the religion accommodation exercise. Okay. Now, here's a question I wanted to ask. If you have the vaccine, and employees get it. And let's assume an employee registers in their county and goes and gets it, you know, as an as an employee of an employer. But it's a second dose you get, and you know, some people have felt bad on the second dose, run a little bit of fever, aches and pains. 
Here's the question. Um, do employers provide or can they provide or should they provide paid leave for an employee on that day they're recovering from the vaccine? It's a great question. Um, it is, and it's a function of the employer's policies. So if the employer, if that particular employer is still offering the Families First Coronavirus Response Act um, compliance, they're still offering employee paid sick leave or employee, <coughs> excuse me, emergency paid sick leave act under FFCRA, then it would be covered. If the employer has a sick leave policy, it could be applied to that. There might be PTO, right? That applied to that. Depending on the extent of the reaction and the personal circumstances of the employee, FMLA might apply. Um, if their local jurisdiction has any local ordinances or their county has any ordinances that speak to COVID absences, it might apply there. But in the absence of, of all of those, um, there is, that's a sick day like any other sick day. Got it. You know, here's, here's, a, here's a question that I guess we're all kind of hoping to have this decision, but let's get past COVID-19, hopefully, and kind of get back to normal, try to achieve herd immunity. And so many of the employees have been working from home during the past year. As things change, as hopefully they improve, can we require them to come back to the workplace or can they continue to work from home as long as they wish? You can require them to come back to the workplace as makes sense for your workplace. If they're disabled and believe they are prohibited from returning for some medical reason, they're gonna have to provide medical certification from their physician and you're going to want to go through the standard accommodation exercise that you do for any other request for accommodation. Good answer. Uh, and I think that question is going to be one that you're going to hear more frequently uh, from employers. I know you covered this, Robin, but I just want to make sure everyone on the webinar heard this. You know, since we've had COVID, it really has, as you described it, all hands on deck in the workplace. So if managers have been doing more than just managing, is that going to come back and be a wage hour violation? It shouldn't be so long as it only occurs during the public health emergency. So if we've got, we've, you know, a lot of folks have changed, uh, kind of informally changed up job descriptions, right? You just kind of, you do what's necessary today and that might be very different than what's necessary tomorrow. Um, and we have gotten used to kind of free willing day-to-day um, -day responsibilities just to, you know, to get through the day. Um, and so the Department of Labor has made clear that's okay during the public health emergency. They understand that's gonna happen. So I think the important response will be Keep an eye on that public health emergency guidelines. Right, right now, I think it expires April 20th. Don't know if it'll be extended or not, but if it's not, that means on April 21st, you got to go back to the same um, rules on exempt work and non-exempt work. So you can't do more, than, you know, the majority of your work is going to have to be exempt in order to keep that exemption. Who actually, just for the benefit of the people, who declares the public health emergency? Um, the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So it, at the federal level. At the federal level. Yep. So states cannot overrule that. Well, they can set their own public health emergencies for the application of their like local ordinances and things, but because is a federal department of labor rule you would run a run concurrently with the federal public health emergency right we've got a couple other questions just popped up i think i know the answer but robin i want to make sure you approve uh 
some of the people would certainly like to get a copy of the slides uh, or the recorded version of this today. Chris has recorded it. Are you going to allow us to share your slides with the people that registered? Absolutely. Great. So we've answered that. So, Robin, let me ask your advice. You know, when employers look at their workplace, what do you suggest are some of the things they should do to ensure they audit that workplace for CDC and OSHA compliance? Yeah, given the uh, given the dollars that have been allocated for workplace safety um, and the uh, the criticism that OSHA got for not being really front and center during um, COVID for the first year, I really do think we're going to see a lot of inspections. So there are um, there are a couple of things. I mean, first of all, I would say do a risk assessment, do a safety risk assessment. There's um, OSHA. If you look at the OSHA website, there's a hospital e-tool, electronic tool, for um, that's a checklist on how you can self-audit. Use that and self-audit. The CDC also has a hospital checklist specific to COVID. So you can get them on both their websites. Um, just go there, use those checklists to do your risk assessments. That will prepare you the best you can and get somebody, like, charge somebody to be responsible. So that if they do show up unannounced, you've got somebody that's knowledgeable of the standards, knowledgeable of the, the inspection parameters and can really lead that for you. Great advice, great advice. You know, Robin, Chris is checking, but I think that was our last question. Do you see any more, Chris? That was it. That was it. Well, Robin, uh, we want to thank you. What a great presentation. It really is cutting edge that we need to know. And obviously, in healthcare, workforce is our most important asset. Our employees just do a phenomenal job. And we want to make sure that we're in full compliance with all federal, state, and local laws. So, Robin, do you have any final words you'd like to say before we sign off? Um, the only thing, other thing that I wanted to mention that I think I felt to during the presentation was with respect to vaccines. There's a lot of misinformation out there. I think we, you know, you all in healthcare know far better than probably even I do about all the misinformation. Um, and so education of our, our staff is so important. Um, and there are your state Department of Health have resources available to help you. The CDC has information available to help you. you know, uh, information, education for employees to, to, you know, to make the science clear and to really try to get over that hump of hesitation so that we, as you said earlier, Steve, so that we can get herd immunity. Right. That's great advice. And just so you know, I know all our hospitals uh, here in the DFW area and the hospital council, we're doing massive education campaigns on vaccines. But you are correct when you get into social media and some of the things that circulate, uh, many times it's hard to get people's attention, but we're going to continue to try. Wonderful. Well, Robin, on behalf, on behalf of everyone on the webinar today and on behalf of the DFW Hospital Council, we want to thank you so much for sharing this great information and answering our questions. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.